Shall we start? Just 30 seconds, huh? Yes. Uh, Deepika is entering you on WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, we, we are live. Now. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on uh, privatization of healthcare. Uh, we thank all the we thank all the attendees and panelists for joining us today. Uh, we will start with a short uh, um, uh, announcement in uh, interpretation announcement in French and Spanish. Will Matthias will do, and then we'll uh, 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 continue. Matthias, you can go now. We have interpretation in English and Spanish. Para ustedes que nos uh, están uh, con nosotros, que hablan español, haz clic en el globo terráqueo para acceder a la interpretación en español. Uh, pour vous qui nous rejoindrez en français aujourd'hui, uh, s'il vous plaît, cliquez sur le globe terrestre pour la interpretación en français. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Delica. Yeah, you can continue. Okay, so uh, I'd like uh, to thank you once again for joining us today in this webinar about commercialization and privatization of healthcare. It's a webinar organized by the uh, thematic circle on health systems of the People's Health Movement, an organization uh, that acts on global level. Uh, and before introducing our dear speakers, who I thank you so much for joining us today, I'd like to start by uh, calling uh, People's Health Movement Global Coordinator, Roman Vega, that uh, will introduce himself and make uh, the opening of this webinar. So please, uh, Global Coordinator, Dr. Roman Vega, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mateus, for this invitation to this fantastic webinar on healthcare systems commercialization and privatization. I will share uh, my presentation in the screen with you. Please let me to do that. Uh, do you see my presentation? Perfect. Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so it is important to introduce this seminar, uh, remembering what has been the process of healthcare systems, commercialization and privatization. If you remember the commercialization and privatization of health systems, uh, is the major strategic health policy put into practice by transnational corporation, some multilateral agencies and governments of rich countries and its allies in the global south at the end of the 20th century and at the beginning of the 21st. This health policy has been created expressly by these actors to generate new spaces in the social fabric for the production, reproduction, and accumulation of capital on a global scale. The early and the middle 20th century was the beginning of a different process that allowed workers, peasants, and other marginalized social groups to develop state and public health systems after the victories of the October Revolution and the result of the Second World War. This process inaugurated the models of social security systems, socialized health systems, national health services, and national health insurances in most of the industrialized countries according to the results of the struggle for health between the major ideological and political forces. However, two other tendencies 
rooted in the prevalent market values of the bourgeoisie and other socioeconomic classes were, were expressed in this process of power relationship, that of the private and pluralistic health systems. In the interim of this process, some countries like the USA accumulate a long experience of capital accumulation, economic and political rationalities in building private ways of financing and providing health services that allow it to expand this capitalist health policy tradition when conditions permitted. These conditions emerged in the 70s and the 80s of the past century, when in the middle of an economic crisis, power relations changed among the workers and the bourgeoisie with the bankruptcy of the socialist countries and the collapse of the welfare state. Neoliberalism emerged flagging the proposal of minimal social state, open markets, and privatization of state enterprises and public services under the justification of reducing state interventionism, optimizing government effects, and reducing its costs. This was, at the same time, a reaction against workers' achievements in social rights and centralized administration of social risks, as well as the opportunity for capitalist classes to invest in social insurance institutions and health services providers by privatizing them. A modern economic and political capitalist rationality was imposed and introduced in the organization of in the organization and functioning of health systems everywhere based on cost efficiency, cost effectiveness, targeting, de-statization, autonomization of individuals as clients of free choice, community responsabilization, decentralized risk management, integrated care, self-care, competition, consumer demand, markets flexibilization, empowerment of managers, entrepreneurship, profit-making, and so on. One of the biggest achievements of neoliberal health policies has been the promotion of the universal health coverage proposal bill under the accumulated experience of health sector reforms in countries of the global south and the north, like Chile, Colombia, United Kingdom, among others. Universal health coverage has rested in the dispossession of public and social goods through different ways of privatizing insurance schemes and public health care services, and the subsumption of primary health care in the form of neo selected platforms based on packages, cost effective and cost-efficient limited interventions. After more than 30 years, the pendulum has begun to swing under the pressure of the resistance of social movements and the accession to power of new progressive and leftist political forces. This is the scenario. This webinar is going to analyze through concrete experiences in different countries in the global south.
Thank you very much. Welcome to the webinar on commercialization and privatization of healthcare services. Thank you so much, Roman, for introducing our webinar. Uh, as Roman was saying, we have uh, our key goals with this webinar together experiencing from all across the globe within PHM uh, circles and allies and helping our struggle to build a common narrative around commercialization and privatization of healthcare towards right to health. Uh, we have speakers from different regions of the globe. And now uh, I have uh, the pleasure to start to call in our first speaker, Sun Kim from PHM South Korea. Um, Dr. Sun Kim is director of the Research Center on Global Solidarity at People's Health Institute uh, and has researched vulnerability in healthcare and access to medicines and pharmaceutical production from a political economy of health perspective. She has also previously served as Southeast Asian Pacific Region Coordinator of People's Health Movement and now serves as Korea Circle Coordination of the People's Health Movement. Sun Kim, thank you so much for joining us today. Please, you have the floor. Thank you for the introduction, Mateus. I did not expect that I was I would be the first speaker. But <laughs> let me uh, share my screen first. Yeah, so I believe everybody can see my screen now. So I was asked by the organizer to present the case of uh, South Korea, uh, South Korea's privatization of healthcare with the case of unintentional contribution arrears under the national health insurance system. These are the questions uh, that I received from the organizer to respond. And the ones in bold are the ones that I added for more background information. So what's uh, privatization of healthcare in South Korea? Uh, South Korea is understood as uh, achieved uh, UAC in a short period with its national health insurance. The government is exporting its NHI model through official development aid to many low and middle income countries. But it has never been highlighted that almost 10% of the Korean population is failing to pay the uh, national health insurance contributions. And 60% of them just can't pay the arrears. And we call it as unintentional contributions arrears, UCAs. And as a result, many of them cannot access uh, basic health care and social services, and even uh, being punished by the government for their arrears through this position. Uh, the national health insurance data shows frequent changes and short durations of their NHI entitlements. And this, this reflects their unstable employment and fragile uh, family relationships. And in-depth uh, interviews with them confirms that the most vulnerable people fail to pay their contributions and their vulnerabilities are aggravated due to the arrears. The denial of the national health insurance benefit leads to denial of tax-based public services. For example, the compensation of medical expenses for pregnant women. And the, the attachment of the bank book for the disposition leads to the discontinuance of tax-based public allowances. For example, the ones for uh, the low-income workers and parents. The UCA is the dead zone, actually, between the national health insurance and medical aid program. The national health insurance covers 97% of the total population, and the remaining 3% is covered by the medical aid, which is a selective and residual public assistance program. And the government has controlled the population coverage of the medical aid around 3%, which is much, much lower than the poverty rate. 
In result, there is a wide range of non-take non up due to the strict beneficiaries criteria and the poor would be struggling to pay the contributions and many of them become unintentional defaulters. Even the government has increased stigma and discrimination against the medical aid beneficiaries and the people with UCAs through a moral hazard frame. And the medical aid beneficiaries and the non-take population, including those with UCAs, have been treated as second class nation under the national health insurance system. And we can say that the government has abandoned the health rights of the poor. Instead, while the government has been focusing on the benefit coverage expansion for the national health insurance beneficiaries and has been failed, the coverage rate of national health insurance has been stagnated at around 60%. This means the patients still have to pay the 40% of the total. And this is the reason why the 80% of the population is pushed to subscribe to the private insurance and they suffer from the burden of the private insurance premium in addition to the national health insurance contribution. And the basic driving force is the private dominated market oriented healthcare system. Most of the providers are private and the most of their services are reimbursed as fee for serve service space. This means the physicians can make a greater margin by providing services that are not covered by the national health insurance, but are covered by the private health insurance. Insurance-based systems only cover the entitled people as defined by the law, and among them, those who have paid their contributions. And even though the problem of UCAs under the Korean national health insurance system has been huge and structural, the government has been ignoring this problem. They believe that it will erode the fundamental principle of the national health insurance entitlement if they grant exceptions to them. But actually, the UCAs are inevitable in insurance-based systems as it presumes the stable employment environment. If the national health insurance and the medical aid continue to be operated in current way in South Korea, which is experiencing an unstable labor market deepening social inequality and rapid family disintegration, then the issue of UCS will, will also continue in the future. The government is implementing only patchwork policies or programs to prevent or deal with the UCS. Most policies focus on dealing with the UCS after people have defaulted rather than on preventing the arrears. And they also try to punish the people rather than support them. And the coercive nature of collection of arrears is justified in the name of fairness. But con considering that these people are not just able to pay the contributions and arrears, the policies or programs that are punitive in nature are ineffective to prevent or deal with the UCAs. To ensure universal health care for all without any exclusion of the vulnerable population, we need genuinely universal system based on the granted health rights rather than on entitlements through insurance. It would be a tax-based non-contributory system with robust public provisioning of health care, which is free at the point of use. What health movements are doing or what they did to resist it? We urge the government to cancel the UCAs. Uh, the photo on the left are the CSOs in front of the government building to urge the government expand the cancellation and the stop and stop the punishment. And we uh, empower the people with UCAs uh, to file uh, collectively uh, the complaint to the government. We also lobbied the parliament to fix the NHI law. We held a forum at the National Assembly and a parliamentarian announced a revised bill which was uh, not passed eventually, but uh, reflected in some part uh, on the final uh, uh, NHL law. We also tried to raise public awareness, uh, insisting that this is not an exceptional case, but the structural problem. And most of all, we empower 
we try to empower the people with UCAs under uh, the moral hazard framework. Uh, they easily uh, feel that these are their own fault, but we empower the people that these are not your fault, but the system's fault. And this is the last part of my presentation. There are challenges remained. Uh, three years ago, the government mandated all migrants living more than six months to enroll on the national health insurance and pay the contributions. But the poor migrants are not guaranteed to be medical aid beneficiaries. And medical, I mean, the migrants' uh, contribution rate is defined as minimum 93 US dollars, which is much, much higher than the Korean nationals' minimum rate. The elderly, disabled, unemployed, and poor migrants are not exempted from paying these contributions. If migrants fail to pay the contribution just once, even by mistake, they have to pay 100% of the total expenditure, and the elderly, disabled, and children are not exempted from this restriction of benefits. Migrants who fail to pay their contributions are not allowed their visa extension. So poor and vulnerable migrants become unintentional defaulters and even undocumented, let alone access basic health care. And under the racist social structure and culture, it is much, much harder to advocate for the health rights of the migrants with UCAs rather than the, the Korean nationals. But still, there is a hope that which is solidarity movement and solidarity will save us all. This is it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diet Sung-Hin, for your very clear presentation, uh, for sharing us the context and for ending with this beautiful message of solidarity on the struggle. Um, we'll have, uh, this is an announcement for everyone who is following us. Uh, please raise your question on the chat, on YouTube comments. We'll try at the end of the presentations to bring questions for a quest and answer session. Um, now I'm gonna ask uh, our next speaker, Dr. Rumia. Remya Kumar. Uh, I thank you very much, Dr. Kumar, for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Kumar teaches public health at the University of Jaffna, Sri Lanka. Uh, she's a medical doctor and has authored several academic articles on health policy, health reform in Sri Lanka, and writes regularly in the media to further her comments, co commitments to social medicine and justice and health. Dr. Kumar, thank you so much for joining us today. Please, you have the floor. Um, thanks for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, it's working well. Thank you. Okay. So um, I thank the People's Health Movement for inviting me to this discussion. Uh, my presentation is a sweeping analysis of the situation um, in Sri Lanka and I'm happy to provide details later. So my talk will be in three parts. In the first, I will highlight some of the transformations taking place in healthcare in Sri Lanka. In the second part, I will briefly link Sri Lanka's healthcare trajectory to policy shifts at the global level. And lastly, I will discuss imminent threats to Sri Lanka's health sector. Part one, the attack. In 1985, Sri Lanka was among a handful of case studies commissioned by the Rockefeller Foundation to showcase good health at low cost, despite the problematic motives during, um, driving the foundation. The report suggested that a welfare and equity orientation was crucial to the progress made in the selected case studies. In Sri Lanka, free education and health policies, which grant non-fee living education and health care as a citizen right, were identified to have contributed to improvements in population health alongside food subsidies. Unsurprisingly, the project was shelved and apparently had no impact on policy. Today, over three decades later, the free health and education policies are still in place. Food subsidies were chipped away and finally removed back in the 1980s. Although the government endorses these policies in that public education and health care remain non-fee living, they have been whittled down and squeezed dry 
to sustain under investment and incentivize private sector expansion. You may wonder why I speak of free education and health when the theme of this seminar is healthcare. I do so because I strongly believe that both these policies have been so fundamental to public health in Sri Lanka. What do I mean by underinvestment and incentivize private sector expansion? In 2019, before the pandemic, the government increased intake into public universities by 30% without increasing budgetary allocations to these institutions, and at the same time channeled public funds towards private higher education institutions. In the health sector, between 1990 and 2009, bed occupancy increased from 50 to 80 admissions per public hospital bed, even as public sector, um, uh, the private sector received various tax and other concessions for its expansion. Ramya, then, yes. Ramya could you go slower, please? The interpreters are requesting. Yes, sorry. The <laughs> yeah. bed. Uh, the burden of this lack of investment is transferred to hospitals, where per capita private expenditure on education and health have risen exponentially. Today, over 50% of total health expenditures transpire in the private sector, overwhelmingly financed by households. The landscape of healthcare has changed remarkably since the turn of the millennium. Although the public sector remains state financed and delivered with no separation of purchasing and provision, there has been a rapid expansion of hotel-like hospitals in urban areas, especially Colombo. Commercialization of healthcare has resulted in excessive medical intervention and overtreatment with unsubstantial increments in public, uh, population health. Private healthcare facilities, many of them physician owned and staffed by dual practitioners, operate on a fee per service basis and make a killing. The growth of private healthcare has led to inequities in access and outcomes. For instance, a person with means living in Colombo could survive a massive stroke by accessing highly specialized, minimally invasive interventional radiology that is now available in the private sector a situation that looks very different to what it did just a few decades ago when state-of-the-art technology was first made available in the public sector. This situation has led to more and more specialists and doctors quitting the public sector to serve in commercial hospitals, mostly located in Colombo. Despite state-led privatization and the relentless attacks on free education and healthcare, access remains far superior in Sri Lanka than in most neighboring countries, precisely because these systems have remained in public hands. At the University of Jaffna, where I teach, students from across the sport, social spectrum enter the medical program. With no tuition, medical education is accessible to many who would otherwise not have dreamt of a career in medicine. Although data is lacking from Sri Lanka, evidence from other settings suggests that students who enter medicine from rural areas are more likely to serve in rural stations. Amidst the current economic crisis and despite shortages in medicines and diagnostics, scores of patients still receive inpatient care in public hospitals on a non-fee living basis. Although they are compelled to purchase medicines and supplies that may run out, especially now in the context of the crisis, the very fact of being able to enter hospital and receive treatment on a non-fee living basis offers more financial risk protection than a health insurance scheme ever could. Despite this massive contribution to public health, the free education and health policies are spoken of as white elephants by the elite, a burden on the state and a waste of taxpayers' money. This narrative is widespread and not limited to Sri Lanka. Part two, complicity. Since the 1970s economic downturn, governments have steadily withdrawn from provisioning welfare. This was achieved through the Washington Consensus in so-called developing countries, rolled out amidst the debt crisis, when indebted governments were compelled to adopt structural adjustment programs that promoted free trade policies and privatization. 
by contrast the 1970s when WHO promoted health for all by the year 2000 in the Alma-Ata Declaration. Since the 1980s, the World Bank has worked with governments to increase the role of the private sector in healthcare. By the 1990s, the global narrative shifted, redefining universality as access to a basket of essential healthcare services to be financed by the state and preferably delivered by the private sector covered by health insurance. The present UHC or the Universal Health Coverage Framework endorsed by the United Nations takes from this 1990s approach. Blatant com commercialization takes place unimpeded, the actual extent of which we do not know. A discourse of public financing has effectively blurred the distinction between public and private provisioning. Hegemonic actors, even the WHO, suggest that traditional models of healthcare financing are not relevant today, given the mixed public-private nature of healthcare financing and delivery. Even the UN's UHC indicators focus on coverage and financial risk protection, masking the expanding role of the private sector in healthcare. Earlier this year, the Lancet Global Health Commission on Financing Private Healthcare called for increasing public financing, a call preceded by a similar one from the World Bank in 2021 in its report titled, Walking the Talk, Reimagining Private Healthcare After COVID-19. Noteworthy is that both reports call for free primary care at the point of delivery, a departure from the World Bank's earlier stand, probably in response to the havoc wreaked by the COVID-19 pandemic. Many view the contemporary calls for public financing for health as progressive. While not objectionable in principle, public financing could also mean unlimited financing for the private sector. Although thankfully not relevant to Sri Lanka at this moment, public financing of the private health sector through health insurance is widespread. Even most recently, by Ontario's Ford government to pri the decision to privatize or the plan to privatize hospitals and diagnostic services that will be covered by the Ontario Health Insurance Plan. Although touted as a solution, there is no evidence that private sector engagement of this nature has contributed to bridging inequities in access. Part three, the final section, another world. What does all this mean for Sri Lanka now? Sri Lanka is experiencing a dire... Yeah, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but uh, uh, could you please be slow? Slower? Oh, gosh, sorry. What, so what yeah, does yeah, all okay. this... <laughs> what does all this mean for Sri Lanka? Now, Sri Lanka is experiencing a dire economic crisis. The already weakened public sector is under tremendous strain. Unhappy healthcare workers and especially doctors are migrating en masse. Some universal primary care programs, such as the school midday meal and nutrition supplementation, are halted without funding. Widespread shortages in essential medicine supplies and equipment are crippling the system. The UNICEF and UNFP have already pointed to declines in maternal and child health. The government of Sri Lanka is looking expectantly to the IMF to haul us out of this hole that only seems to be getting deeper. Austerity measures have already been implemented, presumably to impress the IMF. The cost of living in Sri Lanka has more than doubled over the last six months. Large sections of the population cannot afford to purchase essential food. Children are drop dropping out of school. Parents cannot afford transport owing to the fuel crisis. Public utilities such as energy, electricity and water are under the imminent threat of privatization. The conditionalities that will come at, with an IF, IMF program threaten the social art, the architecture that was the foundation of social development in Sri Lanka. Talks are already underway to introduce fee levying services in public hospitals. Health sciences education, including medical education, has been identified as, promising so as a promising source of foreign exchange. Accreditation is being expedited and plans are underway for private universities to initiate more degree programs. 
The Aragalia movement led by youth in Sri Lanka framed the problem in terms of ir irresponsible governance and corrupt rural, rulers. Various analysts speak of the government having borrowed too much or spent too much and of rulers siphoning funds into their personal bank account. Yes, most governments are corrupt and must be held accountable to the people. Yet, class alliances link the actions of governments to a global system that sustains and deepens inequality. Governments are complicit in perpetuating this debt-driven system that breeds inequality, whether at the global or national level. This system relies on countries like Sri Lanka remaining indebted and dependent. For consumption by the West, whether for tourism, tea as a source of healthcare, or other workers. Clearly, the reach of social movements must transcend the national level given the interconnected nature of these problems. Otherwise, how do we understand that mass migration of healthcare workers from Sri Lanka is linked with the dearth of nurses and crisis in healthcare and education in Canada? The evidence is stark and deliberately ignored. Strong public health care systems are the way forward. No private sector driven system has ever achieved truly equitable access to health care. The experiences of countries like Cuba, Thailand, and Sri Lanka suggest that not only public financing, but also public infrastructure and healthcare workers trained within publicly funded health sciences programs are essential ingredients of healthcare systems. My hope still lies in these systems. Thank you. And I'm really sorry that I went too fast. Hello, Dr. Uh, Mar Ui. Thank you so much for your presentation and express our solidarity with the struggles, ongoing struggles on Sri Lanka. Thank you so much for showing us uh, the main challenges right now. Uh, now I would like uh, to call our two comrades from the People's Health Movement Circle of India. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today, the two of you, uh, Dr. Abai Shukla and Chakuntala, uh, they both work with SATI organization in Pune, in the Indian state of Maharashtra, and they are active members of People's Health, Move India, People's Health Movement in India, and will uh, provide us their statements about this issue. Thank you so much. You have the floor. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot. Uh, uh, and thanks for this opportunity to uh, uh, share some of the experiences and also some of the perspectives that are emerging uh, from the health movement in India. Um, and my colleague Shakuntala will be uh, speaking after me. I'll first uh, give some, I hope you can see my uh, presentation. Um, so uh, basically, first of all, let us look at what happened during COVID. India has one of the most privatized healthcare systems in the world with uh, more than 70% of healthcare being delivered by private providers. And this highly privatized health system during COVID, <laughs> it uh, turned into a catastrophic situation for large sections of the Indian people. Various studies have shown that, you know, uh, the uh, study in the central state of Chhattisgarh shows that almost 60% of the private hospitalizations during COVID had resulted in catastrophic healthcare expenditures. In Delhi, the capital of the country, uh, you know, average cost of one COVID treatment was something like 300,000 rupees, which is a huge amount, something like two and a half years of total income of an average Indian household. And on the whole, Indian households spent more than three and a half times more on COVID than our government spent. <laughs> this is this single figure I can tell you. What is the price of privatization, which is being paid by people? And uh, something like uh, 200 million additional people will fall into poverty due to COVID uh, in the uh, current year. Globally, WHO has, of course, estimated something like 500 million people are being pushed into extreme poverty So, uh, because of COVID. So we know that what is the price that is being paid by people across the world, including India, because of privatized healthcare systems. Now, let's go a little uh, deeper and see what is actually the, the, you know, the results of privatization of health services. So I have compared three Indian states, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and Maharashtra, which have similar per capita incomes similar levels of socioeconomic development. And uh, uh, however, there's a one important difference between Maharashtra and the other two states. Maharashtra has a much more privatized healthcare system compared to Kerala and Tamil Nadu. 
uh, and uh, then uh, we looked at the cave covid case fatality rates the number of patients who died from covid out of every 100 patients and you can see that in maharashtra the case fatality rate is almost twice that of kerala and tamil nadu and if if we uh, you know compare the uh, for example uh, the number of doctors government doctors uh, per 100000 population uh, okay. in maharashtra yeah Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, could you please go slower? Interpreters okay, could okay. catch up. Yeah. The time pressure is there. That's the only thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, no. Yeah. It's better to go slow than okay. we, we can okay. have enough uh, more time. Yeah. Okay. So in Maharashtra, as I said, that Maharashtra has a highly privatized healthcare system. You can see that the number of public doctors per 100,000 population in Maharashtra is only six. In Kerala, it is 15. There's a two and a half times difference. Similarly, the number of government hospital beds per thousand population is less than half in Maharashtra, you know, half a bed per thousand population compared to almost two and a half times higher in Kerala. So we did a quick estimate that if the COVID case fatality rates in Maharashtra uh, had been similar to that in Kerala, which has a more robust public health system, out of nearly 150,000 COVID deaths in Maharashtra, which is a huge number, almost 65,000 deaths would have been less <laughs> if we had similar case, you know, COVID case fatality rates in Maharashtra. And these are states with similar levels of socioeconomic development, similar per capita incomes. The big difference is privatization. So privatization of health services literally can be a matter of life and death. And we saw how large numbers of people are either denied care or were heavily overcharged in private hospitals because of this situation. Shaku will be talking about this. Uh, so in normal times, uh, a privatized health system leads to market failure. And in a COVID period, this led to market disaster. <laughs> and we documented this uh, as Sati has uh, brought out a, a, a book on patients' voices during the pandemic, in which we interviewed uh, patients, uh, COVID patients, uh, during the COVID first wave. And we saw, uh, we actually, uh, this revealed huge financial exploitation of patients with overcharging in private hospitals. Uh, people having to take major loans, lack of transparency, violation of basic patients' rights. Large number of patients complained that the dead bodies, a large number of family members complained that dead bodies of patients were detained for you know up to a day in, in hosp private hospitals just to extort higher hospital bills and payments. And health insurance did not help people much across Maharashtra and even in other parts of India. Uh, and the private sector also uh, you know, evaded many of these uh, regulations. And uh, based on this, now we are doing an in-depth study of 120 COVID hospitalizations from across Maharashtra during the second wave, which is leading to further very revealing and striking uh, findings about how actually private healthcare has behaved during the COVID pandemic. So if we have needed an argument about market failure, <laughs> uh, now the, you know, the evidence is even more stark and even more uh, gross. But we need to also go deeper and look at corporatization of healthcare. And uh, this is a quote from a study which we have done recently on corporatization of healthcare uh, in Maharashtra. Uh, and here we found that we interviewed a wide range of informants, including hospital managers, senior uh, uh, medical consultants, uh, specialist doctors, and also other doctors are working in smaller hospitals. And the view was almost unanimous that corporatization of healthcare is not only about corporate hospitals. They're, of course, the center of the process, but it's a process, it's a larger process which is influencing players across the board and pushing out smaller hospitals, charitable hospitals, or forcing them to become much more commercialized uh, in their approach to compete with the corporate hospitals. And we have some publications on this, uh, which have shown that how corporatizations in, uh, adversely affect doctors, even specialist doctors working in these corporate hospitals who are given targets and other kinds of, you know, uh, you know pressures on them. And this is corporatization is linked with a much larger global process, which the previous speakers have also, uh, you know, indicated. Uh, in India, foreign investment in the hospital sector has increased 100 times, 100 fold, <laughs> in a little more than a decade from, uh, you know, 2001 to roughly 2013. Huge, huge increase in foreign investments in the healthcare sector. And post COVID, these investments are accelerating. And now it is projected that the hospital industry in India, which is the biggest part of the healthcare industry, is uh, uh, there's a huge investor demand. Both global and Indian investors are 
uh, pouring in more money into healthcare because they view it as being prof profitable. <laughs> uh, and we know what the meaning of profitable, uh, you know, healthcare means in the private sector. Uh, it means extortion and, you know, overcharging and profiteering from patients and something like a doubling of the hospital sector and increase in the digital healthcare market. India is a global leader in the IT sector and also has a huge private healthcare sector. Now you can imagine where digital health, it brings these two sectors together and a fourfold increase in the digital healthcare market is also being projected. And a lot of this is being fueled through transnational investments. We are currently doing another study on German official investments in the private healthcare sector. One will wonder why the German government needs to invest in private hospitals in a country like India. It's actually a big question. And we are finding that there are complex global chains of capital flow. They are not always direct. There are intermediaries. There are all kinds of tax evasions which are involved. And these global financial flows are actually fueling privatization and commercialization of healthcare. So now I'll uh, just sort of move towards concluding my part uh, by talking about what is it that we need to do in this situation as a more comprehensive approach. Uh, social mobilization to defend patients' rights, which Shaku will be talking about. Interventionist regulation. Intervention, just talking about regulation itself is not sufficient. We need to differentiate between regulation which streamlines the market for the purposes of capital and interventionist regulation which reshapes the market in public interest and to, to, to promote you know, public interest. Um, and uh, then of course, uh, continuing to challenge privatization, critiquing state supported health insurance schemes and analyzing and challenging corporatization of healthcare and building broader alliances, uh, not just among the ordinary people, but also among healthcare professionals and smaller and not for profit providers who are all experiencing negative impacts of corporatization of healthcare and looking at the transnational investments in healthcare. So I would like to appeal uh, that, you know, when we look uh, at privatization and, uh, you know, uh, the entire phenomenon of private healthcare, we need to take a broader view and we need to look at the entire health system across all different sections. The traditional view has been that, you know, there is, of course, large scale privatization going on and we, to, we need to oppose this uh, through anti-privatization struggles. I would argue that we need to expand our view and bring in the concept of advancing publicness across all segments of the health system. Public health services, which have often been weak, underfunded, of course, they need to be expanded, also made socially accountable with much stronger community ownership uh, so that they can stand up <laughs> to the waves of privatization. Government health insurance schemes, of course, need to be critiqued. And we need to also pro concretely propose public-centered alternatives challenging the denials of cases of you know uh, patient space and the entire private healthcare sector which is divided between smaller providers and large and corporate providers they all need to be brought under uh, some kind of interventionist regulation which includes regulation of rates our experience in maharashtra has been that rates are critical it's a critical aspect of regulation uh, the whole market dynamics gets distorted by inflation of rates and if this is controlled you know a huge amount of exploitation can be checked and demanding patients rights uh, the yellow uh, text in these uh, boxes are about things which actions which can be taken at the community level, at the grassroots level, involving people. It's not just a, uh, you know, a, a theoretical critique or just an academic critique. There's a concrete aspect of popular mobilization which can take place on each of these fronts. And of course, documenting the impact of corporatization on health workers and patients and critiquing transnational investments and looking at these investments. All of these different fronts of action can be bound together through a common framework of advancing publicness and which is not just uh, limited to opposing privatization, but which is uh, seeking to convert all different sectors of the healthcare system in, uh, in a much more public oriented direction and uh, perhaps can be a, a kind of model for us to work on. So I'll conclude here and now Shaku will continue with the concrete experiences of mobilization in Maharashtra. ओके थैंक यू अबे साथ ही जैसे कि हमने देखा प्राइवेट मेडिकल सेक्टर मार्केट में खड़ा है इस सेक्टर के सिर्फ प्रॉफिट के लिए पेशेंट के किए जा रहे इरेशनल प्रोसीजर्स अननेसेसरी टेस्ट एक्सपेरिमेंटल सर्जरीज और उसके अनगिनत परिणाम की स्थिति का सामना लोग कर रहे हैं कोविड महामारी के दौरान निजी अस्पतालों से होने वाली लूट क्रूरतापूर्वक लोगों के सामने आई हमारे देश के कमजोर पब्लिक हेल्थ सेक्टर को कोविड महामारी का संकट झेलना नामुमकिन था निजी अस्पताल एकमात्र विकल्प थे महाराष्ट्र सरकार ने निजी अस्पतालों को रेट कंट्रोल के आदेश जारी किए करने के बावजूद कई अस्पतालों में लूट मची 
एक छोर पर लोगों ने अपने प्रियजनों को खो दिया और दूसरी ओर हॉस्पिटल के हेवी बिलों के चलते लोग कर्जी की खाई में धकेले गए यह वास्तविकता समाज के सामने लाने के लिए और निजी अस्पतालों पर नियंत्रण के लिए जन आरोग्य महाराष्ट्र पीएचएम महाराष्ट्र ने 5 फरवरी 2021 को पब्लिक हियरिंग ऑर्गेनाइज किया जिसमें कई पेशेंट्स राइट्स वॉलेशन की सुनवाई की गई दीपिका प्लीज आई ट्रांसलेट फॉर शकुंतला इन इंग्लिश As Dr. Abhay put it, the private medical sector is firmly located within the market logic. In this sector, people are facing irrational operations, unnecessary tests, experimental surgeries done only for profit, and patients are facing innumerable consequences. During the COVID epidemic, the loot from private hospitals was there for everyone to see publicly and visibly in a brutal manner. Sorry, I'm speaking very fast myself. Ah. <laughs> uh, it was difficult to bear the burden of covid epidemic by weak public health sector alone private hospitals were the only option despite issuing orders for rate control for procedures and tests by the maharashtra government there was loot at one end people lost their loved ones and on the other hand were pushed into debt due to heavy bills of the hospital to bring this reality in front of the society and to control the private hospital jan arogya abhiyan maharashtra organized a public hearing on 5th february 2021 where hearing on the patient rights violations was conducted okay next 2021 mein second wave ne bahut zyada uttar pradesh hui thi oxygen ventilator beds shortage ke chalte कई लोगों ने जान गवाए जन आरोग्य अभियान महाराष्ट्र और कोरोना एकल महिला पुनर्वसन समिति ने जॉइंटली 2,579 फैमिली का रैपिड सर्वे किया जिसमें कोविड ट्रीटमेंट में 75 परसेंट ओवर चार्जिंग की केसेस दिखाई दी एक मुद्दा यह भी था कि इसमें 50 परसेंट कोविड के कारण पति की मौत हुई ऐसी महिलाएं शामिल थी दीपिका um there was a lot of turmoil in the second wave many people lost their lives due to shortage of oxy- oxygen and ventilator beds ventilator beds jan arogya abhiyan maharashtra and corona single women rehabilitation committee jointly conducted a rapid survey of 2579 families where in 75 cases instances of overcharging in covid treatment came to light 50% of these cases were women whose husband had died due to covid okay next ye survey ke facts media aur politician ke saath share karne ke liye jan arogya abhiyan aur corona medical samiti ki ek koshish rahi jisme anger assembly health minister maharashtra ke sath meeting hai aur state level pe kai important adhikariyon ke sath meeting ki gayi okay uh there was an attempt to share the findings of the survey with the media and politicians in in which anger assembly uh, comma meeting with health minister etc were held next ye sab ka parinam uh, ye hua ki complainants ne uh, apni complaint darj ki jiska uh, uh, jinke billo ka audit kiya gaya aur excess amount jo hogi वो रिफंड किया जाएगा ये ये सर्कुलर ये नोटिफिकेशन स्टेट लेवल हेल्थ मिनिस्टर से जारी हुए आज तक सिक्सटी थ्री को 16 लाख 50,000 रुपीस रिसीव्ड हुए द रिजल्ट ऑफ ऑल दिस वाज दैट डिसीजन वाज मेड टू ऑडिट द बिल्स ऑफ दिस कंप्लेनेंट एंड रिफंड वाज टू बी मेड इन केस ऑफ एक्सेस चार्जिंग till date 63 complaints have got uh, one uh, 16 lakh 50000 rupees um uh, back okay yeah that would be 1.6 million roughly yeah okay. next sathiyo punjiwadi duniya ke hum sab vikte mein baat sirf is desh ki india ki nahi balki kai desh yah paristhiti se guzar rahe aaiye hum sanghathit hokar स्वास्थ्य सेवा के निजीकरण को चुनौती दे 
और लोगों में संघर्ष की एक तार छिड़ी पब्लिक हेल्थ सिस्टम को स्ट्रेंदन करना और प्राइवेट हेल्थ केयर को रेगुलेट करना साथ ही आम लोग और मरीजों को मजबूत करना निजीकरण को रोके रहना और पब्लिक सेंटर यूनिवर्सल हेल्थ केयर का झंडा लहराना यह हमारी तमाम हेल्थ एक्टिविस्ट की जिम्मेदारी बनती है दोस्तों हम इतिहास से सीखे हैं परिस्थितियां तैयार होती है तभी तो परिवर्तन होता है थैंक यू friends we are all victims of the capital, capitalist world and ethos it is no, not only about india but many countries uh, which are going through this situation we need to collectively challenge the privatization of healthcare we need to collectively challenge the privatization of healthcare and create a thread of struggle among the people strengthen public systems and regulate private healthcare strengthen common people uh, stop privatization and wave the flag of public center universal health care we have learned from history that only when circumstances and the right ground is prepared that change happens thank you thank you thank yeah thank you so much uh abai shukla chanko and dipka for providing us the context and to inspire us with the experience of PHM India, especially in Maharashtra. Very rich presentation, thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to continue uh, encouraging you to providing us with questions and comments. It's a very uh, rich uh, comment section we have here today. And I'd like to uh, invite uh, our next speaker, uh, Lee Haynes. So Lee is an organizer with People's Health Movement Networks in Europe and in the United States of America. She is originally from Texas in the USA, but currently Lee is based in Brussels. She's a PhD researcher at Kent University where her research focuses on the influence of social movements on health policy. Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. Please, you have the floor. Thank you for the invitation. I am really happy to be here um, with colleagues and comrades working on this, on similar issues from around the world. Um, and I'm particularly excited to be following um, the previous presentation where um, Dr. Shukla kind of mentioned where, or at least the focus of the work um, in PHM North America and our organizing about um, or around privatization and commercialization of health services. And so my short intervention is more about um, how we in North America are trying to approach the issue um, as opposed to you know, shedding more light on the, um, the impacts of privatization because there's so much research, there's so many stories um, from the groups of people who have been impacted, including healthcare system users, but also workers. And so I just wanted to share about um, how we're organizing and trying to, um, yes, organize our focus on the issue. And so just briefly, um, about you know the problem in North America. It's very interesting for me um, being from the US organizing alongside Canada, very closely with PHM Canada and um, my colleague Baj Mukhopatai. Um, because in the in Canada, there is more of a public social health system, while in the US, um, privatization, as most people know, is much, much more pervasive and is very um, symptomatic or emblematic of the type of privatization um, and the subsequent poor health outcomes that we see in the US, um, similar to across the globe. And so just a couple of examples, and I'll put some links um, in the Zoom chat but also in the, the YouTube chat just for um, pos posterity. So just very briefly, um, in both countries, there is a deepening of privatization. Um, in Canada, public services or the public health system is kind of being whittled away. 
while in the U.S. there is a growing resistance to um, efforts at strengthening a public health system and providing more public health services. Um, and among the examples I put in the chats, um, for example, in the U.S., one of the effects of privatization has been the closures of hospitals in rural areas, which creates a huge inequity in terms of health outcomes for people who live in rural areas. About 15% of the population of the U.S. lives in you know, small towns where they have to drive everywhere. There's no public transport, but um, over 50% of them have to drive around um, 200 kilometers or um, that's about 150 miles to get to a hospital. Um, similarly, in Canada, um, we talked to activists there who in Alberta were organizing against privatization of diagnostic services, where, as has been demonstrated in other areas, um, you know, this privatization was threatening to lead to less access, um, especially financial access for patients and users of the system. And so in Alberta, they were able to organize against um, that effort at privatization, which you can see in the um, in the chat, one of the links in the chat I posted. And also in both countries, you know, we see the same unjust impacts um, as um, Abe Soon, the previous presenters said, um, there's unjust impact on poor communities, on migrants, on racialized groups, and our focus has been on um, long-term care centers, and um, and so this is you know the vulnerable population that is the elderly, our elderly folks, and people with disabilities. And um, and there was we saw with COVID this disproportionate number of deaths in long-term care, and we like to point out, um, and as Baj says, that this is very much manufactured risk. Um, by number one, privileging profit over care. Number two, by keeping um, racialized, feminized workers insecure so that they have to work multiple jobs um, during COVID, exposing themselves and their patients to greater risk. And then finally, um, just kind of warehousing vulnerable people and in institutions um, so that society doesn't have to see them where um, there could be a different approach um, than what privatization pushes um, rather than an, an approach that embedded, embeds those folks and their care in the community. And so as we um, have been organizing around privatization, our effort has been kind of seeing what social movements across the globe um, have been doing in their organizing and especially successes um, um, against privatization, which you can see here in that link that I just stuck in the chat. And, um, and it's been, it was very interesting because it led Baj and I to ask like, what is the cause of all of this? And so that caused us to take a step back um, and, think about like what is the underlying phenomenon. And that's what um, Abe mentioned is that, um, you know, in our research and talking to folks, um, we've uncovered, you know, that this is very much driven by private equity investment. Um, equity, private equity companies like hedge funds are investing billions and billions of dollars in um, particularly long-term long care but this is happening in other sectors of the healthcare system. Um, and also these companies, um, they have many guises. Um, for example, they have like very complicated, intricate corporate structures um, where, you know, the company is incorporated, you know, in Canada, but maybe owned by some company in France where the name isn't really attached to any tax or other public documents. And then ultimately, um, you know, the, the ultimate owner is say um, a subsidiary or a company that's incorporated in say Gibraltar or the Cayman Islands, which, um, you know, obviously is a tax haven. So, um, investments in long-term care and other 
areas of the health sector is being used to, um, as we know, rack up profits, but also to, um, you know, hide money and be able to avoid taxes. Um, and then finally, another interesting thing that we discovered, um, or at least that kind of came out of discussions, is that uh, a lot of international consulting firms um, like McKinsey um, are advising governments toward privatization. And we haven't been able to dig very deep into this web, but um, but it seems that there's you know a lot of um, you know board directors are friends with consultants and you know have relationships with government members and there's just a lot of um, what we might call corruption going on there and at those higher levels decisions are being made you know basically around money um, that are driving what we see you know on the ground all over the world um, and leading to incredibly unjust health outcomes and violating the right to health. And so to wrap up, um, I just wanted to say a little bit about what we're doing, what we're trying to do as far as our organizing and mobilizing goes. Um, what we struggle with is that the issue is very complicated. I'm talking about you know, equity and investments and returns and subsidiaries and incorporation structure. Um, and so that really gets buried in data and long technical reports. And so one thing that we think is necessary and are trying to do is to try to make this issue more accessible. Um, and we've been doing that by um, trying to work closely with other groups that are already mobilizing around the issue. We don't want to try to come in and impose any sort of, um, you know, you need to do this in your organizing, but it's important to, um, you know, work with, amplify, build relationships with groups that are already telling the same story and um, plug in. And so, for example, in Canada, um, there is a group of uh, unions, large civil society groups pushing for change. Um, for example, the BC Health Coalition and the Council of Canadians. Um, Baj is a physician in Canada and he's been involved with um, Canadian doctors for Medicare who are actually looking at solutions in the public sector that have been used worldwide that might work in Canada and could um, be implemented elsewhere. Um, there's also a few researchers in the US doing work on um, regulations that might mitigate the impact of privatization and also some particular research on um, why mobilization in the US around this issue is lagging um, because it is a very pervasive problem. Um, and then also just kind of long-term relationship building. For example, um, there's an organization called the Right Care Alliance based in the US um, that PHMUS has had a long relationship with. And as they are re-strategizing and think about, thinking about um, some of their next directions, um, privatization and long-term care might be part of their work. And so that's something that we'll be able to work together on. And ultimately, another thing that we think is important um, is to develop a clear set of demands that the public can rally around. Um, like we are all angry about the issue and um, talk a lot about the problems and the injustice. And, um, but at least personally, what I find is that very clear specific demands that are relatable to the public um, in order to kind of make this abstract notion um, tangible for everyone um, to, you know, to take to the streets over and to demand uh, real change. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I'll put my contact info in the chat if anybody wants to get in touch. Thanks a lot, Lee. That was very useful. And thanks for all the materials that uh, you've been putting. That'll be uh, quite useful for the other anti-privatization struggles uh, in the other countries. I'll move to my uh, move to our next speaker, Leonardo. Uh, Leonardo Matos has a PhD at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Selective Health in Brazil. He's a researcher on health systems and member of PHM Global Secretariat. 
Uh, Leo, you have seven minutes uh, for your presentation. Thank you so much, Deepika. Uh, hi, everybody. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good night for different regions. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I'm going straight to the point. Uh, I would like to share a little bit of the Brazilian case, um, how we have been facing privatization uh, and what are the issues that it brings to our health systems, our health system nowadays. Uh, hopefully we have a good dialogue here. So, all right, let's go to the beginning. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Leonardo Matos. Uh, I'm based here in Rio de Janeiro, uh, University of Rio de Janeiro. I'm also part of a research group here that studies uh, financialization and, 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 and commercialization of healthcare uh, here in Brazil. So I would like to stress uh, a few points. Uh, first of all, is trying to make a discussion about the Brazilian case. Uh, about how uh, how is, is it possible to universalize healthcare without facing and challenging privatization? Uh, second, I would like to share a little bit about the the, the financialization of healthcare, which is something that is uh, is being really attracting to to the Brazilian health system uh, nowadays. And by the end, uh, talk a little bit about uh, resisting uh, of privatization. Uh, okay. So uh, the Brazilian, Brazilian case, I think it's very important and illustrative for, for our comrades around the world because, uh, uh, because, because Brazilian, Brazil has a great experience on universalizing healthcare here. We created the Unified Health System, SUS, uh, in, in the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. And this uh, uh, allowed us to have a lot of achievements. achievements. Uh, we made... Uh, 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 health a right, universal right, and, and the access to, to, to health uh, became free and universal uh, for all those in the Brazilian territory, not just Brazilian citizens. Uh, and this unified health system, they linked the right to health to, to, the, to the labor markets. Um, it it brings to us a, lo a lot of innovations, decentralizations, uh, uh, decentralization of management and provision and funding uh, to federal, state, and municipal level. Uh, it create, uh, permitted, allowed us to create new provision uh, and man measure, management instruments uh, and uh, several other innovations, institutional innovations. Uh, this, the creation of SUS also uh, allowed us to expand uh, and in a very decisive way, primary health care to almost 60% of the Brazilians uh, and also hospital care, urgency, emergencies, uh, and, and so on, and several other public health services as well. Uh, but at the same time, the Brazilian health system, although the intentions uh, were very good, uh, it was very limited by the neoliberal policies, both macroeconomic policies and both uh, the state uh, in the neoliberal context. Uh, so uh, it was an, uh, the state in the end was a weak state without the proper funds, uh, fragmented public, public sector without much control over private sector. Uh, and this uh, brings us a, a lot of limitations to access inequalities uh, uh, in different areas, although we universalize healthcare and, and, and SUS allowed us to, to reach a lot of achievements. Uh, by the other side, the, the liberal policies didn't never allowed uh, our public health system to be as big as it should and, uh, and, and, and as the Brazilian people need. Uh, by the other side, our, in the last 30, 40 years here in Brazil, we also had not just the, the, the creation of the, the SUS, but also we have to face an historical and institutional heritage of privatization uh, that came just since from the, the 50s uh, to the 80s. And this wasn't really faced in the reform, the Brazilian reform. Uh, so nowadays, uh, although we have a universal health system, 60% of the funding is private and just 40% public. Uh, we have a very preeminent private health insurance sector here. Uh, that covers 25% of the Brazilians, uh, a highly segmented model uh, attached to labor markets, although SUS is not attached to labor markets, private health insurance is pretty much attached to it. Uh, and this private health insurance system uh, concentrates a lot of resources, collective resources, financial resources, infrastructure, professionals, and so on, and competes against SUS in, in, in different ways. Uh, by the other side, uh, the private provision uh, uh, remained uh, uh, very preeminent here in Brazil, and SUS, and SUS is really highly dependent of private providers, 
uh, to diagnosis, to hospitals uh, and specialities. So uh, uh, SUS relies mostly on contracting private sector in different areas. And uh, we also have a, a process of privatization in public management uh, uh, related to these ideas of new public management and so on that we, we have seen in different parts of the world. Uh, and also we have a lot of uh, importance of the, the whole of the state in this, in this case, uh, not just uh, legitimating uh, the, this privatization and the private health sector, uh, but also give you tax exemptions, credit to private sector, and, and not controlling and regulating properly uh, 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 this private sector. So, yeah, and recently uh, these contradictions uh, have been even uh, become greater and deeper. Uh, even progressive government governments, we have like measures such as the liberalization of foreign capital in health services. And especially after the coup against Rousseff in 2015, uh, austerity policies came really strong, uh, neoliberal reforms toward primary health care, um, several reforms proposal come from private sector. Uh, Bolsonaro also uh, had a very terrible hold during the pandemic, uh, uh, disrupting the SUS institutions that were built in the last uh, uh, 30, 40 years, although the, the system showed a, a great resilience, but uh, the damage uh, couldn't be totally contained. Uh, and you also can face the record activity in healthcare markets. And, and stock markets after the pandemic in mergers and acquisitions and uh, 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 equity funds investments and so on. So uh, yeah, and, and what what is the treat right now that we'd like to stress for, for you that here in Brazil we are facing uh, is about financialization uh, uh, of healthcare as well. Uh, recently this week, we uh, uh, a new series of article in a Brazilian uh, uh, paper called uh, reports of Public Health uh, published 10 articles, uh, uh, mostly of my research group, uh, talking about different, more than six, seven different areas of the private sector in health in Brazil and the process that uh, of change that is going through since the, the, the year the 2000s. So uh, we kind of analyzed the transformation of Brazilian healthcare companies between 2008 and 2016. Uh, and what we faced and the results showed to us uh, that financialization became uh, uh, a decisive aspect of competition and accumulation in the health sector, uh, both for, for firms to achieve short-term results and expansion of the enterprises. Uh, so these this, this enterprises go through a lot of changes in governance and scope, capital structure and funding, uh, merger and acquisitions, intensification. Uh, they start to capital, capitalize a lot through investments and fund and, and, and equity investments. Uh, they start to use me uh, financial mechanisms of papers, debits, and derivatives to, 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 to its day-by-day -day operations, uh, find mechanisms of risk transfers uh, to financial markets and, 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 and so on, and also try, uh, start to, to use uh, each time more financial income as some part of the income of this enterprise, of health enterprises. And this has a lot of political and health consequences uh, uh, this link of health companies and health corporations with financial sector uh, makes the private sector uh, um, much more powerful. Uh, uh, it helps to converge interests of financial sector and health corporations, which is something terrible. Uh, uh, and uh, we lose uh, public and democratic control of this for, over these firms. Uh, there's an increase also in costs and prices pressure, uh, 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 both in public and private sector. Uh, yeah, and it's also linked to its technology, technology incorporation and, and, and local and global inequalities. So, yeah, what we... we Leo, we can, can you wrap up? Can you start wrapping up? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, what I would like to, to, to just to stress regarding financialization, that is not just a problem in Brazil, it's a problem in the whole world. Uh, so, uh, we have to face that healthcare had become a, a really interest uh, class of assets to financial markets and investors. So, even before the pandemic, it was already really clear this, this trend. Uh, and, and now, even uh, after the pandemic, the uh, health sector has been showing uh, results much better than other places of the economy, which have been attracting uh, investors. So, this is something, a reality that we have to face because this had become a really structural issue for our health systems in the world. Uh, yeah, I would like to say a little bit about the people's resistance here against the privatization in Brazil, but I think I took too much time uh, in the other points, so I can leave it for the, the commentaries and, 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 
and answers in the end. So yeah, but basically these three challenges I would like to face that universalizing healthcare without facing privatization is very, can be very, very limited. Uh, that we have to connect local struggles to deep to structural changes. It's not just necessary to resist to privatization and to defend public universal health systems, but it has to be, these struggles have to be uh, uh, attached with other, uh, with other bigger struggles and linked uh, uh, in different aspects. And financialization must be stopped. Stopped. We have to find ways to isolate health goods as common goods and the link it from financial markets. This is very decisive for the futures of our health systems. We can keep the dialogue afterwards. Thank you very much. Thanks, Leo. Thanks a lot. We hope we'll have time uh, in the discussion uh, session to talk more about this. Uh, since we want to have more time for discussion, I'll uh, not wait more and ask our next speaker to join. Our next speaker is Dan Owala. Uh, Dan is the national coordinator of the People's Health Movement. Sorry, I believe we had a small issue. Can you, can you invite Mario first because he has to leave, Mateus. Oh, I'm so okay. sorry, Roman, I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll introduce Mario first. Then um, since Mario has to leave, uh, I will uh, invite him first. Uh, just a second. So, uh, yeah, so Mario is a medical doctor, a master in bioethics, PhD in history and actual director of the public health at the Colombian National University. Um, thank you, Mario, for joining us today. Um, yeah, you can start. Muchas gracias. Buenos días, buenas tardes. ¿Me escuchan bien? Sí, te escuchamos. Gracias. Ok. Um, voy a hacer una presentación sobre las limitaciones y alternativas a la privatización estructural de la salud en Colombia, porque es el ejemplo mundial de cobertura universal en salud que impulsa tanto el Banco Mundial como la OMS en este momento. Me concentraré en las dos preguntas que ustedes sugirieron, eh, con un cierto énfasis en la primera, para entender bien qué es eso de privatización estructural. El punto de partida, y creo que vale la pena que lo pensemos en conjunto, entender que el tema de derechos depende de la correlación de fuerzas en cada estado nacional y en redes socioespaciales de poder, y es muy importante eh, identificar esas redes socioespaciales de poder y la correlación de fuerzas en cada país para entender las trayectorias diferentes. En segundo lugar, quisiera que hiciéramos conciencia de que lo que ha pasado en el siglo XX es un proceso de expansión de un modelo, un proyecto de salud atado a la biomedicina que es parte de la colonialidad en salud. Es la imposición de una manera de entender y resolver los problemas de salud que viene desde el siglo XIX con el pensamiento hegemónico científico técnico y que se ha venido incorporando en las luchas, en las luchas, especialmente capital trabajo durante el Fordismo, pero que esto ha permitido también crear, como decía Román al principio, un complejo médico industrial muy potente, muy funcional a la acumulación de capital. En tercer lugar, las trayectorias nos han conducido a estructuras de sistemas de salud distintos según las regiones, Europa Occidental, Canadá, Estados Unidos, países socialistas, incluso los que hoy quedan, y nuestros países del famoso tercer mundo inventado por el desarrollismo eh, colonialista que hizo fue separación según capacidad de pago. Colombia es un buen ejemplo de esa separación, segmentación de poblaciones, un, eh, un recurso público para pobres, con instituciones para pobres, 
una seguridad social limitada con instituciones para trabajadores formales de la economía formal y un sector privado muy dinámico. En Colombia se intentó, como en otros países, un modelo que se llamó CEPALINO, dirigido por la CEPAL de la OMS, de la Organización de Naciones Unidas, perdón, que intentó integrar esos distintos sistemas, esos subsectores, pero no se logró prácticamente en ningún país de América Latina y el Caribe. La integración se convirtió más bien en coordinación, pero en Colombia este debate se dio en medio de un conflicto político-militar por el cierre del sistema político. No hubo dictadura, pero sí hubo cierre del sistema político, pero una élite muy excluyente. Esto fue lo que quedó en los 70s, que es muy parecido a muchos países latinoamericanos. Por un lado, asistencia pública a cargo de un ministerio de salud y su red pública. Por otro lado, un seguro social para trabajadores formales con instituciones desiguales y, y, y beneficios desiguales y un sector privado completamente separado. Esta dinámica de la posguerra con los pactos de Bretton Woods y toda la creación de esta idea del estado de bienestar, pues también favoreció la conformación del complejo médico-industrial. Y es ese complejo médico-industrial el que presiona los estados nacionales para liberar los mercados que estaban cerrados alrededor de derechos proveídos por estados de bienestar. Eso pasa en Europa, pero en América Latina pasa con más facilidad porque eran eh, sectores absolutamente segmentados, parcializados, que se podían privatizar más fácilmente, pero por una una crisis de sobreacumulación, como lo ha descrito Harvey, y es muy importante entenderlo, que rompió los estados, rompió los pactos, abrió los mercados y se empieza a generar un nuevo régimen de acumulación, primero financiarizado, con predominio del sector financiero, y poco después con el conocimiento privatizado a través de los derechos de propiedad intelectual. Eso hoy en día constituye el capitalismo cognitivo, que es el que ordena finalmente lo que pasa especialmente en el sector salud y en educación. Lo que hemos visto con la agenda internacional, primero promovida por organismos financieros y ahora asumida por la Organización Mundial de la Salud, es una lógica de privatización estructural con programas de ajuste primero de los estados, después con una lógica de pluralismo estructurado que ya les voy a explicar y luego con manejo social del riesgo y cobertura universal en salud. Es muy importante entender que esta ruta es funcional al régimen de acumulación financiarizado y eh, de capitalismo cognitivo. Este modelo precisamente de pluralismo estructurado en salud, se construyó en América Latina en los años 90 por ex ministros de salud de Colombia y de México con esta separación de funciones. Eso es muy importante. Se dice el financiamiento debe ser mayoritariamente público para obligar a la gente a pagar según su capacidad de pago, seguridad social, cotizaciones, más impuestos específicos para salud, luego es público. Pero esos recursos públicos se transfieren a unos intermediarios que son intermediarios financieros que reciben unos recursos per cápita, a eso le llaman disque seguro, unidad de pago por capitación, per cápita, a cambio de un paquete de beneficios. Esa es la lógica de la modulación y ellos son los que articulan supuestamente los recursos con los prestadores. ¿no? Ese intermediario es muy importante entenderlo porque en Colombia es estructural. Y esto que uh, todos Mario, ustedes... ¿sí? Can I request you to uh, start wrapping up, please? If you could wrap up in the next one, two minutes. Okay, uh, Matthew, can you Bien, ok, voy entonces más rápido, sí. Gracias. Decía, esto tiene una serie de fundamentos. En Colombia se dio en medio de la guerra, 
una constituyente que interpretó derechos como servicios públicos que podrán prestar particulares, eso se llama Estado regulador, y dividió en salud pobres y no pobres, los no pobres tienen que pagar, los pobres reciben un subsidio, una unidad de pago por capitación para entrar al sistema, y esta es la lógica estructural de privatización del sistema que ha logrado cobertura universal, 99% de seguros, de asegurados, pobres y no pobres, ¿cierto? ligado a, una, a un modelo de reprimarización y dependencia tecnológica internacional, y claro, lo que hace es reproducir la desigualdad social, como se ha visto por muchos eh, estudios, con un, un debilitamiento del ente territorial, del Estado, de la salud pública, y un crecimiento progresivo de estos actores privados intermediarios que se han convertido en grandes empresas transnacionales. Aquí hay una ruta de esas empresas, cómo se han venido convirtiendo en transnacionales. Viene la pandemia, que obviamente es más allá que un problema viral, y demuestra otra vez la inequidad. Eh, hoy en día tenemos un muy buen estudio que eh, acaba de salir como el, el esquema de aseguramiento en salud es el mayor contribuyente, es el que explica mejor las desigualdades que se presentaron en COVID-19. Claro, las luchas, eh, bueno, durante la pandemia se dieron, desde antes venían, esta es una comparación internacional, pero desde el mismo momento de discusión de la Ley 100 de 1993, pues ha habido toda esta lógica de movilización y hoy en día, con una coalición entre movimientos sociales y partidos políticos, tenemos un pacto histórico que ganó las elecciones y que nos da la posibilidad de desarrollar una ley estatutaria que dejamos allí puesta en medio de la movilización social por distintas vías y cómo esto implica entonces un nuevo, un nuevo, no, el, no un ajuste, un nuevo sistema de salud que queremos realmente pensar en salud, buen vivir, vivir sabroso, dicen nuestros pueblos negros e indígenas, y con una perspectiva de alternativa al desarrollo, que cuide la vida, que cuide la vida de las personas y de los no humanos, que supere el extractivismo, que supere la deuda ilegítima y que supere los derechos de propiedad intelectual de manera territorial, con una forma de organización de territorios de salud y paz que permita, ahí sí, desarrollar la atención primaria en salud con total participación intercultural y que ordene las redes de atención de acuerdo con necesidades y no con negocios establecidos por los actores privados. Eso es, creemos que es necesario profundizar esta discusión mundialmente porque se confunde el asunto solo como hospitales y clínicas y nada más. No, es mucho más profundo, es estructural y hace parte del capitalismo cognitivo contemporáneo. Y queremos construir más, más pluriverso que un universo. Muchas gracias. Thanks a lot, Mario. We again hope that uh, you'll be uh, uh, able to uh, stay for some time in the discussion. Thanks a lot. Uh, I will now request uh, Dan to uh, 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 make his presentation. I'll again repeat his introduction. He is the national coordinator of People's Health Movement in Kenya, a human rights defender activist trained as a paralegal who also studied human rights and sustainable economic development and resource governance. Dan, you have uh, seven to eight minutes for the presentation. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I did not prepare uh, a PowerPoint presentation, but I will just speak uh, about the situation here in Kenya on privatization. First, to begin with, uh, so that we all understand, Kenya has a six uh, tire health care system. Uh, five levels which are managed by uh, 47 evolved county governments and one, uh, the level six, which is the national referral uh, uh, hospital. Now in 2017, uh, uh, Kenya prioritized uh, health as uh, one of its key uh, 
uh, agendas for the president and the administration uh, brought about uh, the universal health coverage program which was piloted in few counties in this country and uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, vehicle to arrive at UHC was the national health insurance fund right, the NHIF and it was through a nationwide expansion insurance, which now brought in uh, the private uh, sector into the, uh, the new program, which was launched by the president. Now, in order to deliver on its commitment to achieve the UHC, our government pursued a, a de facto privatization that risks uh, uh, the right to, to help in Kenya by deliberately expanding the role of uh, the private sector while uh, simultaneously negle neglecting the public one. This uh, has represented uh, a major departure from uh, what was piloted during the UHC phase, which had, uh, had then eliminated fees at public facilities. And now we have seen instead transformation uh, from uh, provider of health services to, to, to purchase. So NHIF, so that you understand, is a public uh, entity, but now it enrolls both private and public facilities. And as we've seen, a significant shift in spending towards the private sector. Private providers are now in the driver's seat and receive higher reimbursement for services they, they they are providing. So uh, there was a survey which was done in 2018, which uh, revealed that uh, thousands of public and private healthcare facilities uh, on a day what they, they were surveyed, only a tiny fraction of about 6% had all basic amenities and none had all essential medicine. So many of these facilities, though understaffed and accessed by uh, uh, healthcare, is highly an equal and, and long uh, economic lines. An estimated 1.1 uh, million people are pushed into poverty due to the cost of health in 2018. So we are falling uh, short in realizing the right to health, even though it is guaranteed under our constitution which requires the health facilities, goods and services to be available of, and of good quality, culturally acceptable and accessible to everyone without discrimination. So policymakers have pushed to increase the role of uh, played by the profit private actors. And this have seen a, 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 a mushrooming of health, private health providers even in the informal uh, sectors over public uh, public uh, facilities. So privatization, as we speak, has been embedded in key national policies and overreaching our healthcare policy for the 2030. So this colleagues is not just a talk, the government has embarked on a large scale contracts with private health sector, including private public-private partnership, offered favorable tax incentive and expanded national health programs, like the Linda Mama, which is supposed to guarantee that women deliver to free in public to include private health providers and effectively subsidizing private care. So this administration's signature policy for achieving UHC and uh, planned national uh, expansion to actually accelerate privatization with a transformation shift in the government's role from a provider of health services to a purchaser. As a result, uh, the role of private healthcare providers has grown. Kenya has long had a mixed healthcare system, but historically relied on its nationwide network of public. Needs. However, 
a number of private facilities and the proportion of total health expenditure they have received have rapidly increased over the years. For example, in 2013 to 2020, the proportion of private for-profit facility grew from 33% to 42% of the total, while private clinics experienced a more than six-fold increase in the share of health spending country. So as early as, uh, uh, historically, if I may share, as early as 2010, the World Bank uh, called for several pro-private sector measures, and it has since provided over $90 million uh, in loan, uh, in its own words, to kickstart Kenya's public-private partnership programs. This includes a loan whose disbursement is tied to progress moving the public-private partnership agenda forward, such as gazettement of new regulation and closing of agreements. So the bank's work in Kenya is consistent with its broader global commitment to maximizing uh, finance for development, which was adopted in this. This approach explicitly prioritizes private sector solution in achieving development goals. Under it, the World Bank supports public funding only when it concludes there are no private sector solutions, that no amount of reforms or incentives can produce one. It is evident that the national development agencies have sought to promote private sector in Kenya and time with an explicit aim of creating opportunities for their own domestic companies. Kenya, though, is not selling off its public health care sector, which still provide most of the health care in the country. However, the embrace of private facility via the National Health Insurance Fund is part of a broader push to get private actors into the business of health care, amounting to uh, privatization. This approach is embedded in key national policies that seeks to expand the role of the private sector. Uh, how much time do I have left? Uh, you are uh, you are done with time. You can close, uh, Dan. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, these have been uh, one of the, the the National Health Insurance Fund is just one example. We had the managed uh, equipment uh, which came to us as uh, a PPP with private companies from outside which Kenya ended up losing taxpayers' money with those companies. And we've also seen private companies come to develop, uh, build hospitals, uh, private hospital, which they end up running for, for a period of time and the public is giving out money. So. This is how damaging the, 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 the privatization has uh, been rooted in this country. Some of the actions we've taken uh, as PHM in Kenya, we went to court to petition uh, the privatization of our national health hospital. We've also been part of the research on privatization and commercialization with our colleagues uh, from the Google Initiative at the New York University. Uh, no university, and we are in the process of drafting a letter to invite a special uh, uh, special procedure for this matter. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Uh, the afternoon we are finished with all the speakers, and we are we do not have much time. We have only uh, ten minutes left, so we are very sorry that we will not be able to take all the questions. There was some there's, there were some very good comments that came in the chat, um, and I think in such webinars, what what the first thing that strikes you is are the commonalities across um, across different countries and how things, you know, despite so many changes, still remain the same and so many there's so many common uh, issues across the across the countries. Uh, so uh, so how we are planning this now is. Uh, we will. We've just been able to take one question, and we will ask that. We will request speakers, you know, if they have to respond, uh, if they have any response to that. And 
along with that they can give their closing remarks uh, and if they do not want to uh, yeah so it, uh, otherwise they can just give the uh, closing remarks so uh, one of the questions in the chat was from jyotna is uh, i think this was when abhay was speaking uh, as to what are the defining features that distinguish privatization from corporate corporatization uh, so maybe i'll ask abhay uh, to respond first and then i'll ask other speakers to join uh, yeah okay yeah that's a big topic and i think uh, uh, leo okay. also talked about financialization which is uh, kind of a relative related issue uh, private healthcare has been around since a long time <laughs> in india and probably many other countries uh and just ownership in private hands is uh, you know um i mean that uh, is a common feature of healthcare in many places what is different about corporatization is that uh capital investment in healthcare provisioning with the explicit primary and overriding intention to maximize profits which is driven uh by you know a certain kind of capital investments which are often may be listed on the uh, you know the stock markets and so on uh, that completely uh, changes the orientation <laughs> or significantly changes the way in which the internal management also of these kind of institutions starts functioning so corporate hospitals uh, because they are uh, they have large scale financial investments they need to show certain returns on the capital investment <laughs> to the investors and there is a huge pressure of a different kind which leads to a distortion of both practices related to the patients and also of the internal management practices of the institution and these all go together as a package of corporatization however the corporatization phenomenon uh, once it gathers steam in a particular healthcare system it begins to influence even other actors who have to because if they bring in new technologies they appear to be more you know updated and advanced in their provisioning of care uh, they get the best specialist doctors they offer high you know salaries or returns to you know a uh, uh, certain level of uh, healthcare staff professionals so it, it it tends to start influencing many other parts of the healthcare system also even smaller hospitals and you know uh, so called charitable hospitals have to start you know competing uh, with these corporate uh, hospitals and corporatization has a larger perverse effect on the entire healthcare system and it's driven by transnational and domestic uh, large scale investments in the healthcare sector in india we see how doctor run hospitals in the 1980s and 90s got converted into you know uh, business enterprises and healthcare from a profession or a service became a more and more of an industry uh, like any other industry and that has a huge perverse effects uh, because all kinds of market distortions and uh, you know financialization is uh, it's injurious to people's health and corporatization yeah thanks thanks abhay thanks for that uh... a uh, response uh, uh i'll ask since ramya has to leave is she still here if she can go next okay i think she is uh, not here um okay uh okay uh sun can i ask you to go next uh, if you have any response to this question and uh, if you have any closing remarks and leo i'll ask you to go next so i thought i actually thought that the privatization is a broader concept than that includes the corporatization uh based on the south korean experiences especially the case of ucas so for for i think for many people expansion of individual responsibility as in the case of uh, ucas in south korea would be uh, better understood uh, with the concept of privatization rather than uh, corporatization but uh that means uh, uh that means the the decrease of the state responsibility which is not justified in any sense in health sector uh, but of course some people say that individualization is also a feature of uh, corporatization uh, uh if we can understand the individual as a kind of corporate or entrepreneur that would be my answer to the question yeah thanks sun uh, uh sorry leo instead of you i'll ask first mario to um, 
go first if he would want to respond to this or had any closing comments um, regarding the difference between privatization and corporatization. Sí. Sí, muchas gracias. Creo que es importante entender que el proceso de conformación de grandes corporaciones transnacionales es algo que viene dándose durante el siglo XX y con esta fase de transformación del régimen de acumulación hacia el sector financiero y el capitalismo cognitivo se ha impulsado todavía más con el apoyo de la agenda internacional de ya no solo organismos financieros como el Banco Mundial, el FMI, sino de las mismas organizaciones de Naciones Unidas. Hay que decirlo con todas las letras y con todo el impulso de la industria farmacéutica que ha logrado que los derechos de propiedad intelectual estén atados al sector financiero a través de de las bolsas de valores. Esto es lo que jalona todo el proceso de biomedicalización, toda la exclusión de cualquier otra alternativa y claro que es contra un monstruo gigante que estamos luchando como movimiento por la salud de los pueblos en todos los países. Eh, hay que entender el tamaño de reto que tenemos porque es una estructura de economía política muy densa. Aún así, la, la lógica, la perspectiva territorial de articulación global de experiencias diversas, creo yo, y creemos muchos, es una ruta muy importante para trabajar colectivamente a través del movimiento. Gracias. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Mario. Uh, Leo, you can go next. Uh, I would just like to complement uh, more the distinction, not just about privatization and corporatization, but privatization and financialization. Uh, Mario actually started talking about it. Uh, financialization can be understood as the main uh, aspect of the accumulation pattern during neoliberalism, uh, which is the phase of capitalism we are right now. And financialization uh, is something that it's related to economy, to the state, to ideology, to a, a lot of things. Uh, and uh, during the historical process of accumulation in the last 30, 40 years, it moves from different economy sectors, becomes in, uh, it starts in the United States uh, and Europe and central countries of capitalism and moves to different economy sectors. And the, the, the most important thing in the 2000s uh, onwards that, that it Uh, came really strong to the health sector. This is something historically uh, new. It was already there before in other places, but in the stand and the extension, it, it was much bigger. But financialization is not is the same as privatization and neoliberal reforms, for example. Uh, it can be related to it, but usually you don't see privatization and, and neoliberal reforms referring to financialization and the consequence of financialization. But uh, uh, financialization can use from the market structures created by neoliberal reforms and also by different forms of privatization to boost accumulation and to link uh, uh, healthcare assets and health systems, health, health systems infrastructure to financial markets in the way uh, uh, we've been discussing. So uh, in the end, there's a lot of heterogeneity, you know, there's not just one way that financialization uh, can, can, can be expressed in, in health systems, it can be seen in corporations, it can link Uh, uh, public policies to financial markets. It depends on the, the, the country, depends on the sector, depends on the, the, the companies, depends on a lot of things. So it's very important to, for us to take into account that it brings a lot of diversity, not homogeneity. You know, when you talk about financialization and privatization, you're talking about forces that also drives our systems to very chaotic and diverse formats and, and, and configurations. Yep, something that I would like to stress. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. I have been left with the task to make the final remarks. I guess the main thing I can say now is a big thank you uh, for all of you who attended today, for our dear speakers that have presented us a very rich and inspirational scenario for a struggle for health. I thank also our interpreters that did an amazing work 
making sure that this message could reach a uh, different, different audience. And I guess it really expresses the diversity that people's health movement and even the struggle for health has in its content. Uh, today, it's important to remember that we also remark the third uh, death anniversary of David Sanders, a historical and very important activist that was one of the founders of the People's Health Movement. So it's important to make this remark. And with this, I'd like to conclude. And on behalf of the Health System Thematic Circle, and I believe on, the, on behalf of my dear moderator, Deepka, as well, who I thank you as well very much for sharing this panel. Thank you so much for this webinar. And we continue on our struggle for health, or as we say in Portuguese, a luta continua. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.